Ne Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Today we celebrate, uh, it's the Saturday of Our Lady, um, so that the readings are chosen for based on their nativity. Uh, but I'm going to speak about this morning, I'm going to give the same sermon I gave last night, uh, because I forgot to record it. So uh, if you came last night, you'll hear it again, but I think if you were here last night, you wouldn't mind hearing it again, because it's a fascinating story. And it is Our Lady of Prompt Succor. And this is a title of Our Lady uh, properly belonging to the United States. This is not some other country's title or some title from the Middle Ages. This is from, it received approbation, let's see, in 1851. Pius IX authorized public devotion to Mary under this title, Our Lady of Prompt Succor. And he designated January 8th as uh, her feast day. January 8th, um, based on what happened there in 18. 15, January 8th. Anybody know history? Okay, we'll find out. Uh, so, Our Lady Prom Succor. The story begins with the French Ursuline nuns in uh, the Louisiana Territory in 1727. So, we're not, this is the United States doesn't even exist yet, and Louisiana is filled with um, swamps and uh, dangers, and I, I guess it still is. Um, uh, but then also, like, Indians, right, uh, settlers, and so on. Um, so the nuns established a convent and they founded uh, what is the oldest girls' school in the territory of the modern-day U.S. Um, there wasn't even a, unite, a nation yet. They had the, one of the first schools there. So who did they educate? The children of European colonists. They educated Native Americans and they educated slaves. Right? It didn't matter who you were. The nuns, you know, if you were a child and you needed educations, the nuns would love you and they would teach you. Right? That's what the Catholic Church always does. Right? We were, what is it, um, like... Uh, tolerant and open-minded before it was cool. Um, when it was still like, when that, that's what it is. All men are equal before God. And all, especially all children, are worth loving, right? And then the nuns of the church have always known that. That's why one of the great evils of abortion, right, is hating children, hating life. So uh, these nuns educated these children, um, regardless of who they were, what their status was. And here's a great, um, another great uh, lesson in international relations is that Spain uh, acquired the Louisiana Territory in 1763. Spain and France, both Catholic countries. Now, if, if, if a territory undergoes a political change, and now, oh, we were French and now we're German, you know, you expect some political changes to take place. What's a change that took place in the convent? They got some Spanish nuns, right? They, they shared, they helped each other out because that's what Catholic, the Catholic Church does, right? So that, that's the open borders. The open borders belong in the Catholic Church. They've been doing, she's been doing it for a thousand years, longer. So uh, you've got French nuns here, you've got Spanish nuns here. Um, now, 37 years after that, so now we're talking about, it's been 70, almost 80 years since the nuns first got there in 1727. So now it's um, 1800, a completely different nuns, still carrying on the same work. Now the territory came back under the French possession, but this was under the reign of Napoleon, the reign of terror. So now it was anti-Catholic, it was anti-religion. So now rather than the nuns getting help from France or help from Spain or help from, from they had to flee. They had to leave the place because they feared uh, the religious persecution. So they fled to Havana, Cuba. And they were there for about three years when uh, President Thomas Jefferson acquired it in the Louisiana Purchase, 1803. So the nuns wrote to him, wrote to Thomas Jefferson and asked him, if we return, we, can we, we be given our property once again? And they still have the original letter that he responded with. And uh, President Jefferson said, I have received, holy sisters, the letter you have written me, wherein you express anxiety for the property vested in your institutions by the former governments of Louisiana. The principles of the Constitution and the government of the United States are a sure guarantee to you that it will be preserved to you sacred and inviolate and that your institution will be permitted to govern itself according to its own voluntary rules without interference from the civil authority. Wish you could get that these days. Uh, be assured it will meet all the protection which my office can give. Uh, so wonderful response from President Thomas Jefferson. Uh, so the nuns returned. And they were there for maybe um, 
oh, another uh, seven or eight years. So this is 1809, and, and they're struggling, right? They, they had to flee. They came back. Uh, some of the sisters, not every, everybody was there. Uh, there was a lot of work to do. So the mother superior there in, in the, the convent in New Orleans requests help from the sisters in France. Come, come and help us out here in America. And so she wrote to her cousin there in France, who was Mother Saint Michel, and she was running a girl's school, and she wanted to come, she wanted to bring some passions with her, uh, but the church in France was suffering greatly as well. And so uh, Mother Saint Michel there in France asks her bishop, can I go and bring some nuns to help them out in, in America, in New Orleans? And he's like, uh, I don't know, he kind of, finally he gives her an impossible task. He's like, well, you know, you don't need to ask me, ask the Pope. Now, why was that impossible? Because Napoleon had just taken him prisoner. Uh, and he, was, he put him in prison for, he was there for like five years. And this is Pius VII, had been imprisoned by Napoleon. So good luck. Good luck in getting a letter through like the blockade. What, what's it going to be? They're like, they're not going to let the Pope uh, communicate, like with spying back and forth. And so it was an impossible task. So Mother San Michel is not daunted, but she goes straight away and kneels before a statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And she says, O most holy Virgin Mary, if you obtain for me a prompt and favorable answer to this letter, I promise to have you honored at New Orleans under the title of Our Lady of Prompt Succor. And there we get the name. And so uh, Mother, uh, Mother San Michel uh, writes her letter, and she sent it on March 19th, 1809. Does anybody know what feast that is, March 19th? I should see heads going up and down. See, yeah, it's the Feast of St. Joseph. So she sends it off. And she receives an answer on April 29th, 1809. Anybody know what that day is? Actually, nothing. It's like St. Peter, I think, of Alcantara. But it was 40 days later. If 40 days later, she receives a reply, and it's favorable, the Pope grants her request. So it got through, you know, uh, Napoleon's uh, barricade, and so that, and she got a favorable answer. So straight away, she gets that letter. It's a, it's a um, positive, and she goes to an artisan, uh, and she, she has this, um, this sculptor make a statue of the Virgin Mary holding the infant Jesus, Our Lady of Prompt Succor. And the workmen carved her with flowing robes in such a way that it appeared that she was moving quickly. That's, and the statue, the original, is still in Louisiana, uh, New Orleans. So she arrived, Mother San Michel arrives in New Orleans with this statue on December 31st, 1810, and with several other sisters to help out the, the nuns there. Uh, so two miracles followed uh, the statue arriving in New Orleans. So uh, the first one occurred in 1812 uh, during the eruption of a great fire sweeping through uh, New Orleans, and the Ursuline convent is facing imminent destruction, and the winds blew this terrible fire towards them. And so the order was given all the nuns to evacuate, uh, but instead of evacuating, uh, they, one of the nuns placed a statue, a little a mini statue, a replica of Our Lady of Prom Succor on one of the windowsills. And then Mother San Michel began to pray. Our Lady of Prom Succor, unless, uh, we are lost unless you hasten to our aid. And immediately uh, the winds shifted and it blew the flames in the opposite direction. Uh, the fire was extinguished and the convent and um, the rest of the buildings in the city were saved. All right, it was a miraculous intervention. A uh, second major miracle occurred in 1815. Uh, this was um, 1815. General Andrew Jackson had 6,000 American troops facing down 15,000 British soldiers on the plains of Chalmette. This is the Battle of uh, 1815 from the War of 1812. And so on the eve of this battle, the eve of the Battle of New Orleans, uh, the people of the city flocked to the convent to pray throughout the whole night, begging the help of Our Lady of Prompt Succor. And so the next morning, the morning of January 8th, Bishop Louis de Bourg offered mass on the altar at which the statue of Our Lady of Prompt Succor had been placed. Now, uh, Bishop Louis de Bourg, um, anybody recognize that name? He's been coming up a lot lately. This is the same bishop who invited St. Rose Philippine Duchenne to, go to, to come to Louisiana, to come to New Orleans. And she did. She ended up in St. Charles, Missouri. He was the one who went to Paris and invited her. Uh, Bishop Louis de Bourg, he also went to uh, New York, where he met Elizabeth Ann Seton. He invited her to go to Baltimore and start a school, so she did. So now this guy, now here he is in New Orleans again, uh, you know, praying mass for the Ursuline sisters. I don't know where else I'm going to find him, but he's apparently everywhere. Um, so he is, he is saying mass for uh, the nuns, and during the mass, you could hear the cannon fire uh, outside. It's firing, the battle's going on. 
Uh, and so um, the prioress of the Ursuline convent, uh, at this time, Mother St. Marie Olivier, made a vow that she would have a mass of thanksgiving sung annually should the American forces win. And the battle had been brought up uh, some previous, in the previous days, the British had landed, they were drawing up forces on their side, the Americans, Andrew Jackson had made a few raids, so this was it, this was gonna be the big battle. Uh, how was it gonna turn out, right? Nobody knew. Uh, and I would just like to pause, I mean, how many people have heard of this before? How many people have even heard that the, this was an event uh, around the Battle of 1812? The Catholic Church is very involved. You can actually find it now. It'll mention it, that, that the people, the whole town, the whole city was coming to pray. Well, at the very moment of Holy Communion during Mass, a courier ran into the chapel and he informed all those present that the British had been defeated. It was a great victory. Uh, shame on that courier. How dare you interrupt Mass? You wait. Uh, I don't care what it is, you know. Don't ever do that. Altar boys, if you're out there, don't interrupt a Mass. You let, let it finish. But a great, um, a great victory, and uh, they ended, they, they finished Mass by singing the Te Deum. And ever since, ever since 1815, uh, there's been an annual Mass of Thanksgiving uh, by the Ursulines there in uh, New Orleans. And in fact, this, um, this victory is memorialized, uh, memorialized in American folklore by a song called The Battle of New Orleans by Johnny Horton. So if you're curious about that song, you can, you can look it up. Uh, but this is it. This is, this is um, you know, part of our American history, Our Lady of Prom Succor. It, it's, it's, it was given by the Pope to us, right, to America. And Our Lady, um, you know, she's looking out for us. She's looking out for our country. All right, what, what, um, what an intervention on, on her part there in New Orleans. Who knows what would have happened had the British won that battle. Um, so I think it's got a special relevance uh, today. Like right now, these, ne these past few days, the next few days, I've never seen the kind of political unrest that I'm seeing today. I think anybody can say the same thing. I've heard that also from, from, from uh, ancient and venerable Americans, you know, eight, in their 80s and 90s. They're like, we've never seen anything, anything, anything like this. So I think it's, it's no accident that we have this, this Feast of Our Lady. Uh, it just occurred yesterday, um, on a very momentous day. Um, like I said, in a couple, a couple days in either direction, what's going to happen to this country? I'm not sure. I really don't know. Uh, people think, oh, it's just going to be a transition and we're going to need a new, a new president. It's going to be business as usual. I don't think so. I don't think so at all. So I think we all need to pray. We all need to pray to Our Lady of Prompt Succor. Uh, she's quick, as, as proven, right? She answers prayers very fast. Uh, she, a, a special saint for America. She's had uh, um, uh, political involvement, we could say, right? Presidents were involved there, Jefferson, uh, Jackson. Uh, I don't think this is an accident. So let's pray to her for, for assistance and aid in, in this, this, these times of turmoil and um, really believe in that. Believe that whatever God allows to happen uh, with, with prayer, he, he, can, he can turn to the best. Whether it, it seems on the outside, whether we, we, we were scratching our heads or think this doesn't make sense, we have the opportunity to be like the apostles when our Lord was in the tomb. This doesn't make sense, but we must believe in the promises of God. We have to have faith, and we can do that. And, and of all the apostles, they all fled but one, St. John the Apostle. He was at the foot of the cross. Why was he there? Because he went to our Blessed Mother. You can see that, actually, in some paintings. You'll see John at the foot of the cross, uh, and the Blessed Mother's holding his hand, right? She brought him there. She took him. So let's do that. Let's hold the hand of our Blessed Lady uh, under the title, Our Lady of Prompt Succor, and, and beg for intercession for our country. God bless you all. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.